Edith just reminded me um, uh, that I, I should make a comment, especially to Waterloo, given the, the strength in the computer science area here in AI uh, and HCI, that I've always, people say, well, you know, are you an AI researcher or are you doing human-computer interaction? And I always say that HCI is a grand AI challenge. It's a harder challenge than chess. It's a harder challenge than Go. It's a fabulous AI challenge. That's what I tell my AI uh, colleagues. It's, uh, so I view it as really um, quite an interesting combination in an interdisciplinary area, which is really a, a grand challenge of our time, how to make systems understand and help people and organizations uh, empower them. I'm not sure who's talking to who with that, with that sound, but what the heck. Uh, so um, today I thought I would talk about um, the 100 year study on AI. Uh, and uh, um, looks like I'm, Edith, will you help me log into the system? I'm actually on the internet. I'm getting some communication right now from somebody. Let me, let me um, ignore this Microsoft person coming through Skype for business. It's so funny. I said, what is that noise? And I see a, a face on my, my, my own screen here. Um, usually, I, I, I didn't assume that I was even on the internet in this computer, but you helped me so, so well today to get on this morning. Um, and so I thought since, since the, um, uh, this, um, uh, hang on a second, and now that causes a little bug in the system here too. There we go. Since uh, the, the invite, I think, went out to um, uh, people outside of computer science, I thought I'd start by saying, you know, what is artificial intelligence and talking to people that might be coming from other parts of campus here today? I like, to, I like this definition here, the study, the AI is a study of computational mechanisms underlying thought and intelligent behavior. Um, if you go back to the original proposal that the uh, founders of AI wrote down uh, in 1955 when they first used the, the phrase artificial intelligence, they said we're trying to find how to make machines solve the kinds of problems now reserved for humans. Reserved is an interesting word, I think. That was 1955. And, and what they, in the original proposal, which actually was for a summer workshop at Dartmouth, they proposed these pillars. They said, you know, we need to really master perception, learning, reasoning, and natural language, they called that as being very special and human. Um, and since that time, because there's been an explosion of uh, different subdisciplines, uh, some are uh, subsets of these, others are other disciplines that we can now consider part of the family of AI, computer vision, speech and dialogue, decisions and plans, robotics, uh, uh, and many other areas, representa uh, representation, uh, even, even electronic commerce uh, agents and so on. Um, we hear about projects like uh, IBM Watson and AlphaGo and Thomas Sandholm, uh, who's Kate's advisor at CMUs, his recent poker wins, uh, the Alberta work in, in gaming, Michael Bowling and others. But we don't realize that the results of AI have been harnessed for decades, often beneath the hood. Uh, in the United States, I'm sure in, in Canada as well, most of the world by now, in the 90s, uh, an AI pipeline was put into place, starting with work at Buffalo, believe it or not, um, that can take uh, you know, scruffy handwriting and route letters, about 25 billion letters per year being routed. I hope that number's going down, given email. But, uh, but, but still, it's, in, it's really impressive what's going on. In, in, in this system here in PCs, um, we have uh, our, our team work with the operating systems group at Microsoft to build a bounded resource machine learning algorithm that's always guessing what you're going to do next. And it's prefetching and pre-computing during idle time to make your computer seem a lot more powerful than it really is. So these kinds of things are happening everywhere, even if we celebrate the big, giant, you know, newsworthy kinds of um, achievements. But we are, I think, at an inflection point in AI with computation and memory. Uh, where they are today, it's pretty clear that the, the, the smartphones in our pockets on many different dimensions or measures are more powerful than the supercomputers in the early 90s with those, you know, remember those blue, the cooling towers and the blue cushions and people sitting around looking at their scientific papers. I mean, in your pocket now, you have that machine, basically. Um, and with the digitization of of the world, we have incredible and, a, and a inexpensive memory stores, incredible amounts of data 
Uh, and and our, our learning and reasoning prowess is sort of keeping pace. Sometimes we discover that the algorithms we've had for many years are lighting up now with the data. And so um, there's uh, our new kinds of services at Microsoft and I think at a couple other companies. There are these, these, these online services you can sort of weave into your code, just like with, with interface call, API calls, emotion detectors, gender, um, face pose that is available off the web for, for just democratization of, your, of the AI into your software, using it daily here. And we're seeing new kinds of applications, some in safety critical areas like driving, uh, AI getting into, into really just the cusp of getting into healthcare now. Um, um, right now as we speak, there's a Johns Hopkins advisory board meeting that I'm missing. I'm on the Johns Hopkins advisory board for the CS department for several years now. And I'd like to celebrate some of the things they do. But this is work um, uh, by Carol Riley, who was a student there several years back, um, showing how you can use probabilistic methods to recognize a grammar of surgery automatically to understand what a tightening suture might be, a loosening, and so on. And these methods have been now employed in prototypes showing how a robotic surgeon can work hand in hand with a human surgeon. So we're seeing these kinds of really powerful applications coming to the fore. Now, I want to just step back for a second, given where we are, and just ask the question, where are things going with machine intelligence? And, and in, in part, what I'd like to do is think about and look back at what futurists have done for a long time when, they, when they, they're asked to think, let's say, 100 years out. This is a picture uh, of, a, of a set of pictures. I'll show you a few more by Jean-Marc Cortet, who in 1899, and you guys understand French up here in Canada, right? Um, really thought through on long 2000, you know, um, and what might life be like? And look at the metaphors that that he's using. Electricity was the new thing on the on the scene in those days, right? So you see a bunch of electrical metaphors. Like, of course, education would be very interesting. This is like a, I guess, the version back then of Coursera, or uh, you know, what might be happening with online edu with education of the future. What would would Rodney Brooks' company be developing? with these home robot, robotic systems that sweep the floor, home, you know, electronic scrubbing, he said here. What would, what would agriculture look like? See the same, same metaphor, like there's almost like a in the box, not breaking out of the metaphor here a bit. You know, everything's kind of electrical and, and, and uh, people just really sit on their, on their rears and get things done. Um, but once in a while you see some interesting pictures in his set here. Look at this interesting photo, uh, or sorry, sorry, his sketch or conception. This is before the Wright brothers built their plane, which looked quite different than this. This one looks like more modern. If you squint, this almost looks like Aleppo today, right? The, the concern with flying machines dropping weaponry on, on populations. Um, of, uh, calling, this is called a torpedo plane. So it's interesting just to think about about where, how we're limited and where things are going if we, if we were to project forward. Can you imagine if people thought about the possibility of this before, in, in, in a milieu where most of the world thought that flight, heavier than air flight, was impossible um, without a balloon board? And so, Grant, I should say. And so, so you can imagine um, uh, there could have been meetings saying, we should have a, a general convention now that we, human beings will never drop weaponry from the sky. And you can imagine if it was a 1902 convention before planes existed, how that could have been world changing. Maybe for the better or for the worse, but it's still an interesting possibility if people were proactive in that way. So speaking of planes, um, my view of where we are with machine intelligence now is we're barely off that sandy beach. We're barely off the ground given the possibilities of where things can go. And I think if people can hear my words 100 years from now, they'll say, yeah, yeah, you had no idea, Eric. Um, at least you had, the, you had a, a smidgen of the fact that you were off the ground and you had this, this, this flapping canvas strapped on some wooden iron for a minute or so, and you had a black and white camera. You were so excited about capturing it with your documentation. But I want people to think for a second now just about possibilities that this is 1903, and a mere 50 summers later, this was happening. 50 summers, right? You can say years, but it makes some sound closer if you say summers. Um, and um, the 707 
taking off with a whole flight industry with c control towers that say the right things, right? The whole infrastructure. And people on these planes worrying more about whether or not their non-fat or dairy-free meal was ordered properly than about the fact that they're flying to Europe, right, from, from JFK. And so things can go this quickly in our field, too. Um, I want you to look again, right? 50 summers. So my sense is, it, you know, when we started thinking of my, my, my family, my wife and I, about, about philanthropy, um, we said, I wonder if we could create some sort of an enduring process. And the motivation that I just shared with you is it's difficult to anticipate, unless you get really sort of mindful and put some effort in, um, opportunities and issues ahead with the advancement of AI. And could we have a long a study with like a long gaze and a kind of a growing memory about what the study had thought about before over time that would continue to go on for a long time? And now, now when I put this together, I, I thought about where to, where to place this, ACM, AAAI, a university. And in discussions with um, John Hennessy, who I'd known, he was on our technical advisory board at, at Microsoft early on, became quite good friends with him. I, I touched base with John Hennessy, and, he, and I thought he'd think it was a crazy idea, but he loved it. And in the press that came out later, he, this was John Hennessy. John Hennessy is not an AI person. He's a compilers guy, systems guy, uh, as you know from his book with, 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 um, with David Patterson, for example. But he, here's the statement he made. Artificial intelligence is one of the most profound undertakings in science and one that will affect every aspect of human life. And he went on to say, and maybe this is Stanford hubris, we, <laughs> we feel obliged and qualified to host a conversation about how AI will affect our children and our children's children. That was a very powerful statement that he made uh, in support of the effort. And he assured me that Stanford would be around for quite a long time uh, even if there were questions about that. Uh, so um, the roots of all this for me were in uh, a set of meetings that I organized in 2008-2009. Um, we involved some fabulous Canadians here, Sheila McElraith and Craig Boutelier, a part of this group. But during my AAAI, uh, during, during, during my presidency, I, I, I themed, I, th I said I need a theme for my presidency. I themed my presidency AI in the open world. And I, in my presidential lecture, I talked about the, need, the, 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 the interesting technical challenges with robust AI as, it, as you translated it into the larger world that was much, much bigger than the representations and, uh, and, the, and, and the design considerations that went into the construction of the systems. I also said we want to sort of have an initiative thinking about AI in society, how, it will, how this, these technologies will be influencing people in society. And finally, my third pillar was turning myself back to the organization. Let's open up this organization. Let's get rid of this lock on all the literature and publications. And that was a big fight, but, we, but I was successful. And AAAI became one of, the, one of the few societies that opens up its literature completely um, at the cost of and the risk of losing membership for people who paid to be a member to gain access. And that was a big internal fight we had that we won. But back to the middle one. So I, I basically said, let, let's actually um, create a, a long-term, we call it the presidential, AAAI presidential panel on long-term AI futures. We called together a team of folks. This is some of them. Some couldn't make it to the actual face-to-face -face meeting at Asilomar. And we met over several months. We had three, work, three working groups. One was AI and short-term disruptions. The th second group was on, was on long-term futures, even considering notions about runaway AI and the kinds of utopias that Ray Kurzweil talks about and the kind of dystopias we hear more, more frequently now uh, written about on AI takeovers and loss of control and so on. And then we had an ethics and legal panel or, or, or subgroup uh, that Edwina Rislin uh, um, and David Waltz, um, late David Waltz, uh, co-chaired. That was fabulous. And so we got together, we had a, a, a day of meetings. And let me just say a couple of things about those, those, the, the meeting we had at Asilomar. Um, we, we didn't publish most of the work. We, we have the whole transcript and video online. And one day we'll put it, on, we'll put it out there, I think. Um, publish a short report. But it was just a fabulous, interesting meeting. I'll mention, let me mention one thing. So I asked Andrew Eng on the first day to say, I said, kick off the day 
by telling us a 15-minute talk, what will surprise us. This was February 2009. What will surprise us in the near future? And he gave what you could later call a deep learning talk. Um, the deep learning bump that I showed yesterday in my talk, the, the technical talk yesterday, um, that bump down or the bump up, depending on how you want to phrase the utility, the cost function, that happened in August of that summer, a few months later. And several other things were said that became to the fore. Like one phrase I hadn't heard before that the short-term disruption group was working on was the phrase criminal AI. And we're seeing more, we're seeing, we're seeing things like that. For example, Stuxnet that was being developed right around the same time as we were talking about the possibilities that even go beyond that, of course. So given how valuable it was, my thought was, oh, and by the way, if you, if you just want to look at headlines, this was, just to give you a sense for how the, the public saw this meeting, and then John Markov wrote a front page New York Times story about it, was this. I mean, it was so much broader than this, but this was the, this was the catching headline, right? Um, but my comment was to myself uh, in 2014, almost five years had passed, and I said, I wonder if we should do this study again, if I can convince the AAA to do another study again. And then it hit me, you know, induction, N gets N plus one, and maybe we should do this forever. And I spoke to my wife and spoke to friends and colleagues and other people, and we said, let's go for this thing, and so let's create something that will have to, you know, be en enduring. And so uh, one thing that I did, you can read this online, there's a, there's a very short, um, like a four-page framing memo at the ai100.stanford.edu site, where it's just a short set of paragraphs, and we said, hey, uh, circa 2014, um, here's what we think are some interesting issues going forward with AI, and we talked about each one. It's interesting to think about when we wrote, we wrote the democracy and freedom paragraph, we said someday AI systems might, in, in a sleuthy way, um, be targeted at manipulating human minds, and what would be the risk to democracy when that happened? And we thought, you know, this is like a problem that might come up like maybe, you know, 50 years from now or who knows when. Uh, and all of a sudden it's like, you know, headline news. And it's not even AI just yet. Just yet, mostly. We're not really sure it's at times what kind of machine learning is being used, for example, and what we've seen with the fake news cycles in the last U.S. presidential election. But several other topics here as well. Um, so the way it works, just going to nuts and bolts right now, is that there is a standing committee that will always persist with rotation with a chair. The standing committee, it, it persists over time. And so right now, Barbara Groves at Harvard is the chair of the standing committee. Um, I'm ex officio on the first standing committee just as one of the you know, sort of authors, just to get a sense for how it's going and to help guide. It's, really, it's a really a fun group of folks. Um, I see uh, Edith Law's advisor there, Tom Mitchell. You've been very, very helpful, uh, and other, uh, other folks. So the idea basically is we take the Asilomar study, the AAA study, as our first study. We say, we, we claim it. So that was the first, that's the ancestor study. And then in 2015, um, we said that we want to publish a report. And the basic idea is the standing committee gets together and meets. We'll be meeting again in, in a week, um, or by our semi-annual meeting. Um, and they come up with a charge. They say, you know, here's the charge we think will be the next study. It's like a three-page document what we think is important. And then we, we invite a chair or co-chairs to be, to say, take the charge and stand up a study panel with about 20 people. And then in one year after you meet and discuss, write a report that addresses the charge. And then the, then the, the, the cycle continues um, and so on. Um, in, the, um, in the meantime, we have projects. So right now, Yoav Shoav, Shoam stood up a project uh, called the AI Index, and OpenAI has come, come to, to support it, and other groups. Uh, and he's, he's, the idea there is we want to build a long-term index of AI competencies across different uh, dimensions of intellect, as well as their influence and impact and uptake by society and other societal factors, even uh, notions of sentiment about AI over time, for example. Um, all, all this um, work gets cached in the Stanford Digital Library forever, including the deliberations of the committee, just to have some historical context as things evolve. Um, uh, and that's why the index fits in so nicely. By the way, if people are interested in the AI index, you should just send a note to Yoav Shoham, who's, who's the, the chair of this, of this uh, 
right now, the, the, and, the, and the author of that, 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 that effort. Um, and the idea is to, is to think about where things are going, to generate proactive guidance, try to be helpful with potential interventions that might come if you do things correctly or wisely versus do nothing, and multiple audiences from AI researchers down to policymakers has to be kind of written in an interesting way that's understandable. So the first charge to the study panel from the standing committee was AI and life in 2030. And um, in the document here um, that's online also, you can see the justification for like, what, 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 what did the charge look like that went to the study panel? It was actually, there's a little bit of negotiation that goes on as well with the chair. The chair uh, was Peter Stone. In this case, all these well-known, our well-known colleagues and friends um, to start with. Um, but the basic idea here was consider the AI advances and influences over the next 15 years, which doesn't seem like a long time. Um, daily life, uh, to consider proactive efforts on technology, design, and policy. And we said, again, for whether we're ethnocentric or not, we said focus on a typical North American city. Just that was the actual focus. We, fit, we felt like this, that cities were a central and human experience. There in a city, um, you could actually explore interdependencies and influences of multiple AI kinds of services working together. Um, and we believe that you know, North American, you know, it's like applies to Western Europe and maybe other cities as well. So you see it has a kind of interesting focus to it. Uh, we asked Peter Stone, was my first choice to stand up the panel. The reason I invited Peter was, Peter was so passionate in the Asilomar study. As a young, new, you know, new professor, he couldn't make the Asilomar meeting. He said, I have to be coming in on, the, you know, on, the, on, the, on a conference call from Israel where I'm, vis where I'm visiting as a researcher. And so we had a sense that he would take this up and really be enthusiastic about it. And he stood up a committee of these folks here that I'm, I'm putting up uh, from different uh, sectors, uh, academics, industry, uh, folks like Astra Teller from Google X, um, AJ Kamar from Microsoft, uh, Ryan Kahlo does law and so on, Greg, Greg Hager. Um, and so the report that came out of that process is now also online. It's a PDF and uh, called AI and Life in 2030. It's pretty impressive when it came out in September, the uptake that it got around the world. Um, what I found most useful in it, it was written for people who just read the like Wired Magazine and the New York Times and Wall Street Journal. What is AI? There was a beautiful section about what AI is that was really well written. I mean, it's just to read it, like two, you know, two to four pages of text that really sort of nicely couch it from the point of view of you know, bright AI scientists that want to communicate clearly what AI is. Um, they chose these eight areas of focus and they described why in the report uh, for ad addressing the charge. I'll go, I'm going to just cover some of these topics now and also reflect with you some additional thoughts about them as a standing committee member. One thing that's interesting is, um, uh, is they, they say right out of the blocks, and maybe 40 years from now we'll say, boy, were those guys wrong about this. But they say right out of the blocks that this, is a, this concern about runaway AI is hype and, dist and a distraction and unrealistic. And by the way, I'll just have to say that um, you see things on all sides here. You, know, you get these, these mythological Halloween costume style pictures coming up uh, and the movie, the movie icons that have pulled in lots of money. I happened to uh, mention somewhere uh, a couple of years ago in a video that it, we don't want to dismiss these concerns, but I, I was relatively optimistic and I said it in a very cautious way in the next, the next day, uh, BBC published this piece here about my comments. AI, like, like surprise. Everybody, despite what you've been hearing, there's a surprising strange guy at Microsoft <laughs> who says out of control AI will not, well, actually the original title was Exterminate Humanity, but our PR department, <laughs> our PR department called them right away and they negotiated this title, will not kill us. And they said, I guess well, that sounds better. <laughs> <laughs> so, here, so, so out of the box, the report says, I, this is fabulous because it, it, we, we looked around and, we, 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 and even the, my, AI, my colleagues in AI said, no one has actually been courageous enough to just say this. 
Now, maybe we're uncertain, but no one has just said this, right? Contrary to the more fantastic predictions for AI in the popular press, the study panel found no cause for concern that AI is an imminent threat to, man, to, to, to humankind. Isn't that interesting that, 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 that nobody has said that anywhere else? Um, and then, then, then this is the kind of, the, if pe for people that try to build stuff in AI, <laughs> like this is like, you know, okay, yeah, it's like we, we get it. No machines with self-sustaining, long-term goals and intent have been developed, nor are they likely to be developed in the near future. You know, and Peter has a startup now trying to do this kind of thing, so I guess he's, you know, I don't know if we should invest in it or not. Well, maybe he's not doing exactly that, <laughs> So I thought that was very helpful. And then I thought a couple of high-level bullet points that they make I think was very useful and healthy. One being that they've called out there's a need to engage. Actually, it's a useful need to engage all of us across disciplines. Emerging technologies have the potential to profoundly transform society and the economy for the better by 2030. But near-term near -term design and policy decisions are likely to have long-lasting influences. This comment has, has framed several other pieces of work, even for me, in terms of other things going on right now that I won't get into today, like something called the Partnership uh, on AI, which is a cross-company initiative. They also said that um, we need to balance the technical, so people here that are maybe from outside of computer science and engineering, we need to balance the technical innovations with mechanisms that ensure that AI's economic and social benefits are broadly shared. And that AI researchers, social scientists, policymakers need to work together. I think it's a really interesting statement. They're, maybe they're kind of obvious, but they're, they're calling this out uh, publicly. Another interesting uh, comment they make right up in front of their, of their report is that where's our focus of attention as a field and as folks interested in translating the technology into reality, we are under-investing resources in studying the societal implications and uses of AI. There in, are inadequate funds for AI research that lacks commercial application, that may lack. And it might not be the case that these tools, which, and it could be that tools you develop for other things, like the, I just showed you the cognitive services, can be used for other things, but sometimes not. Uh, and they thought that we should have targeted incentives and funding to help address the needs, for example, of low resource communities in particular. And they pointed out several projects like lead poisoning effort in at-risk children in, in Michigan, pregnant women at risk for adverse birth outcomes in Illinois, DHS, and work going on in Middle and Tom Bay's team uh, with the social work department in HIV reduction among the homeless looking at, at, at working with social graphs to figure out where to, where, to, where to put education resources, for example. And that private and public dollars should support these kind of interdisciplinary programs in this, in this realm. Another focus of the report was on transportation. Um, it, it, it's pretty clear when, you, when the report points out that if you, if you jump to 2030 in, in, a, in an average big city in North America, one thing that you'll notice will be the, the, the stuff going on around transportation being very different. You know, and this includes, uh, if you, if you, um, you know, notions of microtransit, like whole cities have shut down to car, uh, manually driven cars, and you have community owned <coughs> microtransit micro -transit fleets that are really scheduled well with optimization, you know, and you're very flexible and you call for them. Uh, or even this idea of these personal drones um, that would only be enabled by automation, right? I mean, just building to building hopping, Bellevue to Seattle instantaneously. Um, and so on. Um, and so the comment, the comment there was that um, uh, autonomous transportation will soon be commonplace. Um, and this will be an interesting comment on the first here. This, there'll be a strong influence on the public's perception because it'll be the, really, for many people, the first experience with like, embodied intelligence in, in their lives. People will own fewer cars, they'll live further from work, real estate prices will shift and change. They'll spend time differently. There'll be even, if you think about it, new urban organization, if you really get this right, it'll, it'll change the way cities are structured and what cities are, um, as the internet has already been doing to some extent. Um, and public transportation, these big, these big lunking buses that you know rove around and you wait for in the corners could become personal rapid transit using very small capacity vehicles, as I mentioned earlier. It, 
in healthcare, um, they, they basically made the comment that, um, that there's, a, there's, a, there's a really, uh, you know, they point out that like healthcare has been this long uh, um, aspirational dream in AI. AI and medicine is actually a subfield. And, but as I said yesterday, it's one of the big surprises is that very little has happened to date in many ways uh, in, in core clinical medicine. Um, and that AI, if AI methods promise to change the cognitive tasks of clinicians by 2030 if there's sufficient data and there are well-targeted systems. And they mentioned, they mentioned some of the issues I mentioned yesterday, that the healthcare field is structurally ill-suited to absorb and deploy these advances, held back by regulatory, professional, and commercial obstacles. Um, and this comment, we all know this is true, and we just don't see it happening so fast, so yet, yet there's opportunities to learn from boatloads of data and scientific literature to do personal diagnosis and treatment, create true cognitive assistance uh, that just hasn't happened yet. Um, uh, the, the calling out, which I think we all know, it, that, you know, one job that will never go away no matter how much competition we have is, is, are, is, is important work around human touch and connection between humans. And the idea of the hands-on experience of physicians being critical, um, and therefore, how do you, how do you, if you have human beings providing healthcare and support, how do you mesh the automation and the assistance with, with uh, human care? And then pointed out statistically that in the U.S. here, but it's the same for Canada, uh, the key area of innovation is elder care because the population um, of, of elders, you know, um, is growing. For definition of what elder is, 50% over 15 years, uh, and the need for home human home health aids today is believed to be growing. Will be growing to 40% over 10 years, given our better health and the, 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 our demographics going towards towards the aged. The reports panel spent time thinking, thinking and writing about human AI collaboration. And they said we need to increase the focus on building systems that can collaborate effectively with, with, effectively with people. Um, as AI systems become more central in our lives, there's like kind of a shift to thinking about technical and social and design issues, back to HCI and AI, with um, building systems that are human aware and trustworthy and robust when it comes to working with people. And the fact that these engagements with machines will become more nuanced, fluid, and personalized. Um, and even thinking through what does it mean to have machine teaching, which is actually an area of machine learning and HCI, um, and, in, and the area even popular at CHI now, CHI conferences, interactive machine learning. The idea of if, if we're going to be working with these systems, we may have to teach them a lot in real time, even in a context sensitive this, this task way, you know, like not just training them to do a repetitive task, but what's happening now and quickly understanding what's going on with this idea of a teaching cycle. Just to share some personal reflections about how the human computer collaboration, how critical it is for safety, with the same issues that we're thinking about in AI. Uh, a couple of examples. You, m many people don't, don't consider autopilots. Um, in planes to be AI, but they really are doing some really interesting automation and optimization and controls. So it's a nice surrogate for a future of AI systems as well. Um, and there's a really interesting issue if, if, in not thinking about deeply about human computer collaboration and fluidity and technologies that understand um, what it means for a, to have a human in the loop or a human master or a human as backup when it comes to baton passing, a mix of initiatives. And the, the one example that comes to mind a lot for me when I think about this is, is and I remember when this happened, and I don't know if people remember this story, uh, and there have been many of these kinds of stories, but one salient one is China Airlines 006 in 1985. It was a 747 that was heading from, from Taipei to, to, to Los Angeles, and engine number four failed, which is apparently not a big deal on a 747 to have an engine be turned off. Um, and apparently the plane was, was, was um, on autopilot when this happened. And the autopilot kind of understood the, what the plane, what you need to do to keep the plane flying 
in a stable way with an engine out, but I think it was processing a bit more than the pilots liked. And so at some point in time, the pilots turned off the autopilot and says, you know, probably stretched and wanted to take over. Well, because, my understanding is, because the solution of the automated system when it came to an engine being out was so much different than what the human beings understood, um, when the baton was passed back to the humans and they grabbed it, there was, a, there was just understanding where the system was set and how it was flying stably in an automated way to the human conception of what to do led to instabilities in the transition. The 747 uh, dove 10,000 feet in 20 seconds. The passengers experienced 5G. It's the only recorded history of a, of a 747 going supersonic. <laughs> Those poor passengers, you know, with their, with their, with their, with their Diet Cokes. Uh, and, and, um, and the wings were bent. And, and it, the, the, for what, for luck had it that the pilots kind of figured things out and they righted the plane a few thousand feet off the water. Um, the plane limped back to San Francisco for an emergency landing. And rumor has it that the plane, I think Wikipedia page says this, is, is, has been repaired and is flying again. So if you're on China Airlines, you can only ask, was this the 747 that went supersonic? <laughs> you know, you really look at the wing carefully at the glue and the repairs, where they, where they rebent those wings back to the normal position. Um, we all know the, Air, the more recent Air France story um, out, of, uh, out of Brazil where because of communication uncertainties and understanding you know, with frozen pateau tubes and you, you, for both cases you say, you say what would an HCI slash AI researcher do to, guarantee, to communicate state to understand the, human, the, human, the transition to a human with limited cognitive abilities in real time you can do a lot more to make things fluid and more safe. So there's a safety issue here when it comes to safety critical applications in general. But on, on, uh, uh, so you can imagine, you know, you know, what would it mean to give a machine a model of human cognition? What about transparency of state and explanation, human and, and, and attention? And how do we master coordination of initiatives? And it's only going to get more interesting as we get more nuanced and work more quickly and ubiquitously with these machines. Uh, yesterday I mentioned a little bit about the thinking through human-machine collaboration. Um, there's kind of a spectrum of, of autonomy, even in, in the solutions, for example, transportation these days. You know, the Google folks say, remove the steering wheel. You don't need it, right? It's automated uh, versus another kind of, a, a, of approach. And we mentioned yesterday, we talked a little bit in the talk that, you know, that we have kind of a different abilities and complementarities and we can use AI itself to help do the weave together. And, and of course, on the HCI side and design side, we really have to think about the design of what the conception of how things work in the mix of, the mix, the mix of initiatives. Um, on the upside, just some recent great results that are coming out. Um, last year, there was a, a, a challenge called the Chameleon Grand Challenge. Uh, the, 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 the task was, can you use machine learning to take a, a large training set and ident identify metastatic breast cancer in lymph node slices, uh, histopathologic histo uh, slides. And well, it turns out that human pathologists are better than the, than the best deep learning system for metastatic breast cancer. Um, the expert error was 3.4% in, in, in missing or misdiagnosing, more generally, the, the slide. But even a simple combination of the expert, human expert and the computing system dropped this down to 0.5%. That's, pretty, that's, a, that's a significant drop in, in error rates in a safety critical area. So it raises the hope that there's all sorts of complementarity that's possible in safety critical areas coming up in the future. So um, that, that's, a, I think I just wanted to pause there because I think that particular focus of the 100 year study report is particularly important and it really makes it frames lots of research that we can all be doing right now in, in thinking about the interleave of AI and, and society, and particularly people, and the HCI problems that are coming to, to the fore, often very much in the realm of co cognition and, and signaling and um, uh, you, understanding human attention and ability. Another uh, area that the, the report focused on was um, the idea of, of fairness and bias in machine learning. In, in, in machine learning systems that are being used in critical areas like, like 
governance and criminal justice. And they pointed out that cities and federal agencies in the US and maybe around the world have already deployed AI methods in criminal justice and law enforcement. And they predicted that by 2030, these methods would be heavily relied upon. So the concern was if these systems weren't working properly or had systematic biases for reasons, for example, about how the data was collected. Let's say it turns out that you discover that in city X, um, the police and surveillance were focused on that side of the tracks most of the time, not this side of the tracks. But you don't know that. There's no documentation in this big database of criminality. And then that's used in the future to, to make decisions about um, bail decisions, for example. Uh, Maybe, the, maybe there'll be some systematic biases that are implicit in the data sets that are going to be now amplified by uses, especially if that data set now leads to a system that's used in every city in North America. Uh, so the, the concern is that innocent people may unjustifiably be monitored and targeted, and care must be taken. And we, it's our jobs to point out as technical people that this is a problem, not just relying upon legal folks to figure this out, right, or people in social science our meaning, talking to my, my, my technical colleagues right now in the audience, to, must be taken to, must be take care to avoid systematizing human bias and we must protect civil liberties. And the hope that you know, if AI gets us a problem, puts us in a, in a problem spot, maybe AI tools can provide new kinds of transparency to detect, remove, and reduce human bias rather than to reinforce it. We're kind of at a turning point, right? We can, we can Things can go the wrong way, or we can see, say, say wait, this is a, let's step back a bit, and maybe we can apply these methods to check, for example, is this classifier fair to multiple key constituencies, age, skin color, uh, voice quality, accent for speech recognition, for example. Uh, this is a really um, powerful statement here, that society is at a critical juncture about how to deploy AI-based technologies so as to promote rather than hinder democratic values such as freedom, equality, and transparency. This, to me, is like, this is like probably the most important statement in the document in terms of where things are going. And then staying kind of in the legal ethical realm, which we hear questions about legal and ethics, and people want to teach classes in this, and there's lawyers getting active, and people are saying with hands on their hips, you know, who's liable when that car does X? And what about that ethics issue with the trolley problem and so on? Um, um, I like the way they wrote, they said this. As AI applications engage in human behavior that, were it done by a human, would constitute a crime, courts and other legal actors will have to puzzle through whom to hold accountable and on what legal theory. Uh, and. Uh, this whole idea that um, law, you know, is when you, I'm not a law ex, legal expert, but the more I have dug into it, it's really built on, it seems, they have some principles, but scenarios and precedent and histories of precedent. And there have even been AI dissertations written on reasoning systems that do case-based reasoning and probabilistic analyses of previous cases and similarity to make judgments. And it's, it seems a very tough and challenging intellectual endeavor law. It's not necessarily built on, you know, it's not, it's, not a, it's not a theorem prover by any means to understand what a jury will say and what precedent becomes in different parts of the, of the world for different situations and events with their emotional content and so on. So it's interesting to think about, well, what will happen with laws and the answer is we don't know. And we can't say who's liable now because these questions have not, many of them have not been addressed by the, the formal legal machinery yet. But you can imagine when these questions come up, we all, the people who study these, area, these, these issues in, in AI, for example, and agency, and principal agency and decision analysis, we'll ha we want to weigh in too and not just have precedent be, to begin to grow that might not be conducive to quality of life or, in, or innovation in the future. This interesting issue is of ethical challenges will rise where human injury or death is likely and split-second choices are made about whom to put at risk. 
There's a really interesting set of discussions I know in the, in the US that have gone on that, that have come up to the level of the president, President Obama, that, that we were monitoring and watching from some concerned people, mostly in the runaway AI type of concern that led to letters to, to, to the high offices. And there have been discussions about, shouldn't we regulate AI? Um, and I've had, I've had, I'm glad this report came up with this, with this comments because I feel the same way that when you say, shouldn't AI be regulated? That's kind of like, you get the impression that someone thinks AI is a blue-green gas that's gonna be created and come through the vents. And, we sh and that's stuff we should regulate. In reality, it's, it's a rich set of disciplines with lots of inter, inter, uh, interlocking conceptual foundations with other fields. It's computer science. Um, sure, maybe someday we'll, we'll know more about what certain kinds of configurations of these technologies are when it comes to more general intelligences. And maybe someday someone will say, yeah, back in, uh, you were at Waterloo, I saw that old grainy video that someone shot at Waterloo and you sort of talk about that blue-green gas. Well, guess what? Now, I, just, you know, I, I, I doubt that's going to ever happen. But, but for now, attempts to regulate AI in general, said the report, would be misguided as AI is not one thing. Um, the risks and considerations are very different in different domains. And different industries need distinct and appropriate regulation. So yeah, it's great in the US to see, for example, I know the, 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 the Department of Transportation issued like it was like a like a like a fourteen point set of recommendations about autonomous cars and semi autonomous driving that made a lot of sense. They're all reasonable statements. Should that be issued by the Federal Office of AI Regulation? I don't think so. It doesn't make a lot of sense just yet. And so thinking about um, these these industry specific focused areas of effort and maybe even regulation is interesting. And this other comment is that governments will need to, will need their own AI expertise. So policy people will need to understand this work to, to scrutinize standards and technology developed by the private and public sectors and to craft regulations and guidance and best practices where necessary. And then on jobs and economy, um, this is another hot spot. So if you ask, what I've noticed, if you ask a person in the street about AI and hopes and concerns. And by the way, I think hopes and optimism are still dominant out there. And you can read about that in the AAAI paper we did where we did, used AI methods to, to understand what people were saying about AI over the years. Of course, you have the rise of interest in general. Optimism is ahead of, optimism is ahead of pessimism. But if you ask people on the street, what are they concerned about? It's the AI takeover, Hollywood kinds of stories, Terminator, a uh, dozen Bill Gates, and. Stephen Hawking and Elon Musk, don't they tell us that's what's happening soon? Uh, and Nick Bostrom. And my jobs are gonna be stolen, our jobs are being taken away. What am I going to do? Um, so, so it's pretty clear that, that AI is going to, as the report says, will spur disruptions in how human labor is augmented or replaced by AI. And this will create challenges. Um, in the near term, AI will replace tasks more than jobs, but you can see the jobs going if we sort of automate trucks, for example. I was really surprised how many, what segment of the US population drives trucks as for their main source of living. It's really, it's a bigger chunk than you would think, for example. Um, this is an interesting point that emerging new jobs are harder to imagine than existing jobs that will likely be lost. It's always easy to imagine the fact that all the pooper, poop, the, 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 uh, the state people that maintained stables in Manhattan during the turn of the century, 19th, 19th century to 20th century, those people, you know, it's easy to imagine those people going away and their jobs being transformed when cars come onto the scene, uh, but hard to imagine what, what they'll be doing in the future. Um, and AI advances will lower the cost of goods and services. They can make everybody better off. This whole issue is of, of the idea of labor becoming less important for production versus owning intellectual capital is a trend. Um, the concern that for many, labor may not support desired standards of living if the these, 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 these automated systems that have the intellect of humans in certain categories relied upon for centuries for, to be done by people are now replaced by machine solution. Um, but in the long term, you know, the idea of AI as a radically different mechanism for wealth creation 
where everybody is entitled to a portion of AI produced treasures. But the bottom line is, and this is like today, it's not too soon for social debate on how the economic fruits of AI technologies should be shared by everyone. And I thought what I'd do is just briefly, before I end today, um, uh, uh, talk, t tell you a little bit about a report that was published on April 14th, just a week and a half ago or so. Uh, I served on this committee at the National Academy of Science. Uh, Tom Mitchell and Eric Bielsen were co-chairs. It was an intensive two and a half year study with lots of people outside of computer science. I mean, some computer scientists, but like, you know, labor experts, um, economists, um, people from government and so on. And I wanted to show a couple of charts that came out that are in that report. The report's now downloadable for free, uh, uh, freely on the, the PDFs are available on the Innit National Academy site. But this is, these are important figures and graphs, I think, just to talk a little bit about the labor issues. Here's 1950 to 2010. And the two cur curves here I want to point out here are the, if you take the total wealth, this is in the, uh, in the US, the GDP, and you divide it by the people, that's that kind of, if you just split the wealth equally, that's the real GDP per capita going up because productivity is going up. And when we're, we're wealthy, we're generating new, more wealth over time. But look at the median family income. Take the middle level, median, what families are getting. And there's a, there's a widening gap between what's available and what's being distributed equally to the people in the US. And it's particularly, Look at the year here, 1990. It, there's a, all of a sudden a widening going on. And people are saying this is the significant part of this is our automation, our computing, our intellect. The, the, I'm going to say the intellect, the, the, the intellectual, the, the, um, doing things that we, with, with the machines that used to require human intellect and human physical manipulation. I showed this at, at, at um, a university recently, a bunch of college students, I guess I'm at a university now, and I'm not sure if you're grad students in the audience or uh, how many people in the audience are in a PhD program? Okay, well, you'd be happy to know. Uh, <laughs> it's like, how many of you uh, didn't finish high school? Like, this must be a selective audience here, right? But look at this, this is 1963, uh, and that's the, here, 1963 wages for males, and white males in the United States, um, Sorry, full-time, full-year males. It wasn't white males. Full-time, full-year males on the average. And this is that, that bar normalized across time. Um, and then the blue chart here shows high school dropout. The red is high school, gold is college, and purple is grad school. Well, look at what's going on for folks that don't have college degrees in the US. Right around here, everyone is sort of on the same page. And then we see a crash around 19, look at this timing here, it's like 1980s. Now, stare at this graph, it's not, not gonna be an optical, optical illusion test, stare at this graph and watch the next slide. Are you looking at that graph? This slide came out three days after the election in the US in the New York Times, and the quote was, areas with many white voters without a college degree form the core of Mr. Trump's support. These are the areas by, you know, no college, like no, co no college degree, and that's these folks. And th th this, this, this Times analysis is saying that this is where the support came from for the current president of the United States. So these things have potentially have, have implications, uh, and I, I'll end on this note here. I tend to, to say there's, there's big potential ahead f for disruption and discontent. And I go back to the 16th century, uh, uh, 17th century, 18th century, as the Industrial Revolution was kicking off with the steam engine and with automated looms. Uh, and there was so much discontent at the turn of the 19th century that the British enacted the death penalty for machine breaking. And there was lots of discussion going on here and lots of anger. And you know, people know that, uh, some people think that because of mismanagement and concerns and frustration, we had whole economic systems developed uh, that had world uh, changing implications. 
So I'll stop there. We can maybe just have a few minutes for questions. And thanks very much. Um, I guess you touched on it a little bit um, at the end, but what did we learn? Say that again, last part, last first part of your comment. I think you touched on it a little bit at the oh, end. Oh, touched at the end. Yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> what? I dodged, no, no, touched. <laughs> <laughs> touched. Yeah. From your experience and observations, what did we learn about, you know, society and humanity from this developing of AI that, I guess, in some degree, mimics humans, right, and mimics human behavior and thinking. What did we learn about? About humans, about, about us. Oh, I see. Well, many people in the AI community believe that you know, one of the big um, draws is we learn about human intellect by studying incarnations of that comp in the computational venue. And indeed, that uh, I, have, I, have, like, I think Alan Mackworth uh, over at UBC has mentioned this to me before. Several people don't like the, the word artificial intelligence. And they say, wouldn't it be nicer to have called, I think Alan says this, wouldn't it have been nicer to call the field computational intelligence because it refers to humans and machines? So I think in part we do learn about ourselves. And I have certain results over time in my own work that make me most excited because I think about what it means for me as a mind and us as minds, what, what the implications are of this, like, you know, this proof and this result, huh, that must mean I must do something like this too, even if, unfortunately, approximately. <laughs> so I'm not sure if I gave, if I gave you a good answer, but maybe that was a good answer for some people in the audience. Yeah. Here. So for centuries, uh, we had automated intelligent vehicles with a very sophisticated human-machine interaction. They were called horses. Uh, is there, in terms both of sort of the human, you know, intelligence interaction, or, but also in terms of regulation, in terms of all of these, is there a comparison to be made that, I mean, we've been working with, let's yeah. rudely call them lesser intelligences for the entirety of human existence. Is there a, a space for AI as just another of these? I, I think it's a really great analogy. Um, I'm not a horse rider, but, but I've been on horses. And I often refer to people driving the Tesla, I say it's kind of like learning how to ride a horse. Because you really got to know all these strange nuances of what it recognizes, what it might not recognize up ahead to take over quickly, even though before the car tells you. Uh, there's a learning curve there, and it's not quite nuanced, right? And so you watch people, and I just was actually uh, watching people um, riding horses, and it's really interesting the signaling that goes on and the learning that has to go on and the standards versus personalization of a horse and their, their, um, the rider. Um, it, the other comment is um, horses are, I wouldn't say they're less, they're in, brilliant, right? These are brilliant vertebrates. Yeah, but <laughs> different, well, but they're very similar, right? They may not have language skills, but vertebrate minds, I probably, in my view, is, are quite similar, uh, especially the higher vertebrates. And uh, so you're dealing with a very brilliant um, uh, system or, you know, entity. Um, I, I think I was talking with um, Ken Forbes. Uh, who's over at Northwestern. Um, this was after the German wings pilot put the plane into the ground, the, depressed, the, the purported depressed pilot. And report, you know, these are reports, of course. We don't know exactly what happened. And there was another plane that had been um, um, with a suicidal pilot per report that killed many, many passengers. And we had 9-11 where planes went into buildings. And when 9-11 happened, I wrote this paper, uh, an op-ed that said, airplanes should simply know better. How hard would it be to make an airplane know better about where it is? And certain things, it's just, it just you cannot do with it. It locks you out. Um, so Ken Forbes, back to Ken Forbes, said, you know, horses would know better. Right? Horses would not run into a wall. Horses would not run into a building. So these basic representations and skills we, we assume in situated uh, creatures it's brilliant, right? And they know many things that, um, that we need to sort of, I'm thinking also about not just the human computer collaboration, but the reliability and safety issues as well. So. Uh, thank you for your talk. I would like to touch on upon um, um, 
autonomy, and you, I think you, you kind of talked about this a little bit in your talk. So, as he, like uh, machines displace humans more in, in a, a society, like self-driving cars, um, you know, surgeries. Uh, I think there will be kind of like a zero-sum game in terms of uh, autonomy between humans and machines. Why do I say? That? I mean, because yeah, we have interpretable models like. Uh, um, uh, Decision trees, for example, but they're not as good as like you know more advanced like a uh, uh, like uh, networks, and you know if we're talking about self-driving cars or uh, surgeries, I will you think they would be using more advanced methods, and when things go wrong, we would not be able to you know find out what's you know, what what's what's happening there, and uh, you know yeah you talk about you know like having a wheel in the car in case something goes wrong, but I don't think that's I mean, how it works because you know, we'll be lulled into a sense of you know, like comfort and so when things go wrong, we might be even looking at the windshield. I mean, so, you know, I just... But I, can, I, I can assure you that that actually happens to me today with the, you know, that not, not being on, on the wheel when something might be going wrong. So I understand you're asking a question about transparency, explainability, and the need to, to have systems that you can inspect and that are scrutable. Yeah, I, I don't think there'll be like a, I, I, I don't think I, I think there'll be a, a sort of zero sum game between hum, like autonomy between humans and machines. That, that's what, what I think. But I'm I'm not sure what you think about that. So you, you said several things. I, I think um, um, so. So I do believe that, um, especially for developing systems, we need to understand what's going on. There's some really interesting cases right now where having using linear uh, classifiers led to provided the ability to troubleshoot. Uh, classifiers in healthcare that wouldn't have been as easily uh, understood for the failure modes without in a, in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a forest of tree solution or a neural net and having a, a, a less powerful linear classifier was more understandable to find a problem in the data that was, would have led to real problems and that's a whole story we, I can tell, um, um, a concerning one. Um, I think that there's win-wins in the cases of coming up with powerful classifiers that um, that are also have to have these interpretable properties that are, are known for or the properties of linear classifiers which can at least show what they're doing as a sum of of weighted um, uh, uh, terms and so um, and you could look at the recent paper at KDD by Rich Caruana on our team for looking at um, using what are called technology, I don't know if we technical here, but generalized additive models, which instead of giving you constants on the terms, give you functions. You induce functions over terms and pairs and triplets of terms that give you kind of an explainable system that has the power of the deeper systems that are more opaque. But that all said, and that might be gibberish to half the room, what I just said, let me just say that what is called transparent? What is called transparent today in machine learning? I don't buy. I don't think a set of, a list of terms is transparent. So I think we have a lot of work to do in our community, and this also involves the HCI community, AI community. What does it really mean to, to provide an explanation? And my my recent quip was uh, I was on a panel at AAAI this year, largely with like expert systems people from the past, from the 80s, before the last AI winter. And I, I, they brought me in as the bridge to the probabilistic world that we're in now. But my comment was, and I celebrated them, my comment was, in those days, explanation was considered critical. Expert systems, they had whole dissertations on how do you explain the trace of this expert system to human beings, to end users. And it was assumed that you'd be, dis, you'd be supporting people with decision support. And now, in this world, we're rediscovering this idea of augmenting human cognition augmenting people as a new direction. And that was intrinsic and implicit and assumed in the 1980s. So there's lots of interesting work that was done in the past we need to get back to, but I would say that there's a grand challenge in AI to build and machine learning to really generate explanations and to figure out what people actually need to understand something. And it's also a cognitive study looking at what it is we need to understand and, and the ability to understand something with, with small numbers, seven plus or minus two pieces, for example. And I, we just don't know how to do that yet. And I think that bears on your answer, if not exactly what you were asking. I'm happy to come up and talk to you afterwards. I realize you had, you had more going on in your question. Hi. Um, so actually, before I ask the question, I want to tell everybody that there's a reception next door after the question's okay. over. So. Don't leave. Um, so my question is, um, when we think about AI, we think about 
algorithms and systems that try to make things more efficient for us, you know, do things for us that we don't want to do or do things faster or better. Um, what do you think, um, how do you think AI technology will actually enrich our lives? So what are we missing right now in our society in, in this decade? And how would AI technology actually en en enrich our lives in, in a more um, kind of philosophical sense? So given that we're close to being over time, if not nine minutes over time, um, depending on how the, what the norms are around here, um, let me just say that uh, if you look at technologies in the past, and think about, let's go from the sandy beach and the Wright Brothers plane to the early motion picture machine Thomas Edison had flickering on his wall with his team in New Jersey, um, and jump from that flickering pictures of maybe a horse, thinking of horses, horse galloping, right, with a, a rotating disc, even before that, and flip books, to an intensive, artistic scene in a movie today as the climax reached in that movie, and people in the audience understanding the kind of the deep meaning of what the director and the writer and screenplay, what they were trying to get across. I'm sure AI technologies will be harnessed in these ways, in artistic ways, in ways that open our minds, that help us stay on focus, that you know, per our own interests, that under, help us clarify our goals in life, to empower us. And I'll just leave it to this audience to figure out what might come of that kind of push and the kind of natural, creative, um, life-oriented push that dominates humanity that's part of us, that makes us, that gives us our civilization today. I'll stop there. <laughs>